Hello, welcome to Petrochronix, a research group and extension project focused on petrochronology and its geodynamic implications. We are a group based in Brazil that also has an international network of collaborators. They present the reside in Brazil, Australia, Finland, Germany, Italy, Switzerland and the US. Petrochronology involves several areas of the geological knowledge. We seek to disseminate it in a judicious, yet clear and accessible manner. In our researches, we use macro and microscopic observations, combining fieldwork, detailed petrography, thermodynamic modeling, processes dating, geochemical characterization and much more. From the natural record, we seek to characterize and quantify petrological processes in representative samples, generating comprehensive data sets that are interpreted considering the geodynamic processes that govern the Earth system. We want to share research, from the basic concepts to the state of the art, promoting courses, spreading work results and providing the collaborations between institutions and people. We understand that open science is vital to take down barriers to knowledge and we prioritize the collaborative and open nature of our research. We also propose discussions on integrity and responsibility in the scientific environment. As values, we believe in diversity, representativeness and access to information. We seek to mirror these values in our initiatives. On the YouTube channel, we promote the PTT Talk series, which are presentations on methodologies and advances in cutting-edge research with petrochronology. Our actions also include the organization of lectures, courses, workshops and meeting open to the community. On Instagram and Twitter, we share, on Tuesdays, photos of outcrops and rocks in the field, illustrating geodynamic processes. And, on Thursdays, photos of thin sections with microscopic features with interesting minerals and textures, reflecting different reactions and petrological processes. So, if you work with petrochronology or are interested in related topics, be sure to follow us and get in touch. We want our community to grow even more. See you! Hello, everybody. Hi, everybody. You're on live. Hi, guys. Good morning, afternoon or evening. We are the Petrochronics, a research group and sectional project focused on petrochronology. Here, we'd like to share research and promoting collaboration between institutions and people. Today, here, I have the pleasure to have the catering cut from the Geological Survey of Finland. Thank you, catering, for accepting our invitation. And I really think that it will be a really nice talk. Then we have also here Bruno Ribeiro, a research associate at Curtin University. Also Mariana, a PhD candidate from UFMG. And Guto, a PhD candidate from UFOP. And me, Regiane Fumes, at UNESP. Who work with petrochronology or are interested in these related topics, please follow us on the Instagram, Twitter and YouTube and get in touch with us if you want to collaborate. Now, Mariana, you can talk. Thanks. Hello, everybody. Welcome to our PTT Talk 2021. This, this is the, the PTT Talk. It is one of the initiatives of Petrochronics re Research Group, where we promote talks with Brazilian researchers and international collaborators about petrochronological techniques applied for geodynamic evolution of our planet. So we are here again with another talk 
Thank you, Catherine, for accepting this invitation. We are looking forward for your talk. And now I will give the word for Guto. Uh, he will uh, do a brief presentation about Catherine. Guto, the word is with you. Thanks, Mari. Good, good morning, good afternoon, or good evening to everyone. Thank you, Catherine, for accepting our invitation and enjoy. So today, just giving a brief introduction about your background. Currently, Dr. Catherine Cutts, she works as a senior scientist at the Geological Survey of Finland. She concluded her PhD studies at the University of Adelaide in Australia, to then move on and do postdocs in Stellenbosch in South Africa and in Ouro Preto in Rio de Janeiro in Brazil. Her research interests include petrochronology, polymetamorphism, and paleoproterozoic to archaean tectonics, especially aiming at the understanding of evolutionary aspects and the correlation between terrains. The talk today will be focused on the understanding of garnets and its potential as a petrochronometer. So I would then pass the word to Catherine so she can talk to us about it. Thank you for joining us again. Thanks. Uh, thank you for having me. Um, it's nice to talk to everyone in Brazil and I guess all over the world. Um, so can you see the slides? Is that okay? Yes, it's okay. okay. It's on this Great. Side. All right, I'll get started. Um, so. I called my talk Geochronothermobarometry um, because it's really like aimed at speaking about um, these new methods of in situ dating of garnet. So garnet gives us pressure and temperature constraints and now we're getting ages as well. So we have this brand new word that's really long that we can use. So I think I will just get started. Um, All right, so I thought I would begin with a outline of what I'm going to discuss today. So first of all, uh, why we would want to date garnet, uh, and then I will talk about the uranium lead dating of garnet um, and give some examples. Um, and then I will discuss lutetium hafnium dating and how this works and some examples of this as well. Uh, yeah, so. Why would we want to date garnet? So obviously garnet is awesome. It occurs uh, in most metamorphic rocks uh, across a wide variety of compositions and um, in PT space. Uh, the garnet composition additionally indicates the PT evolution or the peak conditions that the sample has experienced. So you get lots of information from garnet. Uh, so garnet, has been dated since the 1980s, so using these dissolution and column separation methods. Uh, so this was quite a long process. It takes several weeks to do this. Uh, and if you make any kind of small mistake, it's not going to work. Uh, so you've kind of lost all your weeks uh, and your garnet as well, because you have to crush them up and dissolve them in acids. Uh, so yeah, it's a bit painful. Although if, if it's done very well, you get extremely precise ages. So there is some uh, advantages there. But now we can do in situ dating of garnet. So that's what I'm talking about today. All right, so first I will discuss uranium lead dating. Um, so this works pretty similar to uranium lead dating of zircon and monazite. So you can even use the same machine. So we've done it with this uh, sector field ICPMS, uh, which is hosted at GTK in Finland. Um, and I guess also why, you, uh, how, how it works as well would be using multiple minerals for Geochron, gives you insights into different processes and, and the rates of these processes. So uh, yeah, getting the most information from your rock is I guess the goal here. Um, and this uranium lead method in garnet has been shown to work well in garnets related to mineralization. So scans and also uh, high calcium garnets tend to have enough uranium. So one of the drawbacks here is that 
if your garnet doesn't have enough uranium, it's not going to work with this method. Um, but that's why we have lutetium hafnium as well. So it's good to have more than one. Okay, so the first uh, papers that came out using this method are pretty recent. So the first is 2017, um, which is this one on the left. Uh, so this was aimed at dating uh, Groschula andradite garnet. Um, so this is the garnets that tend to be associated with scans or mineralization. Uh, however, it has also been used for dating regional metamorphic garnets. Uh, an example is this paper on the right, which was uh, out in 2020. Uh, so, yeah, it's kind of fairly simple, uh, uses the same equipment most labs already have. Um, and there are some garnet standards available. Um, but yeah, it doesn't work on all compositions of garnet, but it's easy to try, which I think is a, a good thing. So I thought I would go straight into some examples using this method. Uh, so the first I will discuss is Lagoa Real because it's in Brazil. Uh, and this is also a paper that a, a a recent PhD student has just published as well. So this is uh, Marquez et al. 2023 in the Journal of South American Earth Sciences. Uh, so Lago Real is uh, the most important uranium resource in Brazil. It's situated in this paramirium olacogen. So this is in the, the northmost part of this uh, Arasui origin. Uh, the basement rocks for the deposit are the Archean Gavial block, uh, but it's hosted in this Lagoa Real igneous uh, intrusive suite, sorry. Um, so this uh, olacogen is partially inverted during the Arasui origin. Uh, so we have, uh, I guess, some questions about when the uranium deposit formed because it's in Archean rocks. The direct host is, I think, Paleoproterozoic. Um, yeah, and then the Arasui origin came along at 600 to 480. Uh, so again, uh, the Lagoa Real intrusive suite is actually a bunch of A-type granitoids, which intruded at 1.7, uh, and they're also deformed and altered. Uh, so the actual host for the uranium ore is these rocks, which are albertite, uh, and they occur as lenses uh, in the orthonice. So all these grey, I guess, lens shapes are the albertites uh, within this Lagoa Real intrusive suite, um, which is all the pink. Uh, and it is like a orthonice, so it's also quite deformed as well. Uh, so the albertites themselves are classified into different groups based on the major minerals. So there's biotite albertites, pyroxene garnet, magnetite, and epidote. Um, so this is some examples as well of how they look at the bottom. Um, so the mineralization itself is uh, fine-grained uraninite, uh, and it's usually well occurring in other minerals, for example, titanite, garnet, pyroxene, and zircon. Uh, or discrete veins or shear zones in rock, uh, which have little lines of uraninite. Uh, so this is an example on the right of a large titanite grain, which hosts uh, disseminated uraninite. Um, and there's also some zircon in there, which is this uh, pale gray. Uh, so you can see, if you look really closely, the zircons themselves also have uraninite inside. So the reason that this is so hard to date is that most of the zircons give the age of the Lagoa Real intrusive suite, so 1.74. Uh, and then many of the other zircons have this uraninite contamination, so they end up producing mixed ages. Um, and most of these zircons that are associated with the uraninite are hydrothermal, which uh, causes issues when you try to date them. They're not happy. Um, and the same problem with the titanite as well. It, it has lots of uraninite inclusions, so dating it is a problem. So what we did instead uh, is we 
looked at garnet and titanite, which was um, associated with metasomatism, but not uh, uraninite bearing. Uh, so the metasomatism is clearly related to the uranium deposit. Um, so if we get the age of the metasomatism, we should get the age of the uranium. Uh, so our garnet gives um, ages of 545 and the titanite produced an age of 520. Okay, so what does this mean? Uh, so this age is actually corresponding to the end of the Arasui origin. Um, so it's been proposed that there's a, a huge post-orogenic fluid flow event, which is kind of related to the extensional collapse of the Arasui origin. Uh, so there's ages throughout the Arasui origin which are kind of late, so this 520 through to 495. Uh, so we think that uh, Lagoa Real possibly has some sort of relation with this because um, it, it's slightly older, but um, yeah, I think this big fluid flow event is perhaps also responsible for the uranium mobilization. Uh, yeah, and if you look at other uranium deposits, um, these late fluids seem to be quite important, and perhaps in, uh, I guess, maybe concentrating the uranium as well, um, because the same is observed in the Olympic Dam, so they've actually dated uraninite, uh, and the Olympic Dam deposit, uh, I think, is 1590, uh, and they found uraninite ages that are of like 530 and 470. Uh, so they think that this is kind of um, perhaps upgrading of the uranium deposit by like late uh, fluids. So I think we need to further investigate late fluids and their connection with mineralization, perhaps with uh, like extra tools such as garnet dating. Okay, so now I'm going to switch completely and talk about Finland. Uh, so this is quite recent work, so currently unpublished, but hopefully soon. Uh, so the rocks I'm going to discuss now are the Peripoya and Kusumo belts. So these are in the kind of northern part of Finland, uh, in this red box here. Uh, and these rocks are polydeformed. So I've shown this magmatic, uh, magnetic map, uh, which shows all the folding of the sediments. So I think the, yeah, I think there's like magnetite and graphite in some layers and they've been aligned and totally deformed uh, multiple times. So what I want to do here is to understand the relationship and the timing of this metamorphism and deformation. Uh, so to do this, I've looked at three samples from Peripoya, so two in the north part and one in the south, and two samples from the Kusumo belt. Uh, so these rocks, are, so in Peripoya, uh, the rocks in the north are fairly high grade, like uh, granulites. Um, but they kind of preserve two metamorphic textures. So there seems to be some kind of early garnet kyanite, potentially storolite, because we see kind of small relics of storolite in some places. And this is overprinted by garnet cordurite silimonite plagioclase. So we see these textures of um, uh, these very obvious blades which really look like kyanite um, but if you check them the, the thin sections they've been completely replaced by silimonite so it's just recrystallized in place and they all have these little coronas of cordurite so they're actually very impressive looking uh, and it's very obvious we have these two overprinting events uh, so i've done i've done some pt modeling and our early event is kind of uh, moderate pressures, like up to 10 kilobars uh, and 700 degrees, whereas this overprinting event is much lower pressure, maybe like four kilobars and perhaps also 700 
degrees or perhaps a bit warmer. Uh, so I've dated this sample in particular with monazite and it gives an age of 1880. Uh, so I looked at a second sample from the north of Peripoia uh, and this one I think didn't have that much monazite. So instead we dated apatite and it gave an age of 1790. So it's like 100 million years younger, the apatite. Uh, and this rock has like exactly the same textures as the other one. Uh, and then in the south of Peripoia, the rocks are quite different actually. We only see the garnet cordierite event. We don't see any kind of earlier um, ages. I mean, uh, earlier textures, sorry. So the monazite here is also different. It's 1790, so it's the same age as the appetite from the north samples. So perhaps this one only records the younger event. Uh, so in Kusumo, uh, here we have kind of intermediate. So we have garnet storolite. Uh, so we get uh, kind of intermediate pressures uh, and temperatures. Uh, and here we have apatite uh, and monazite again, which are young, so 1790. Uh, and I think monazite has a bit of variation depending on where it's located in the rock. So I think the ones in biotite are a bit older and the ones in storolite are a bit younger. Uh, so for Kusumo, uh, there was some monazite which gave older ages, um, and also the garnet here is uh, 1890 as well. Uh, yeah, so to summarize everything, uh, in the north of Peripoia, we have monazite that's 18, well, 1890, apatite that's 1790, and garnet which gives 1860 ages. Uh, in the south of Peripoia, we have monazite that's 1790, but garnet is still old here, so 1870. Uh, and in Kusumo, monazite and apatite are young, but garnet is still old. So the old garnet actually is preserved everywhere. Um, but we have a uh, resetting of monazite in the south of Peripoia and in Kusumo, but not in the north. Okay, so the Speckofanian orogeny, uh, which is what has affected these rocks, it has five deformation events and it's uh, it occurred between 1.9 and 1.77. Uh, so most of the mono, uh, metamorphic ages relate to either the D5 or the D3 events. So D3 is this 1880 and D5 is the 1790-ish. Um, so the question really is how do these two ages relate to the metamorphic evolution and what it means for ore formation because there's a lot of uh, mineral deposits in, in both Peripoia and Kusumo. Uh, so all the uranium lead apatite ages were 1790. Uh, so obviously the 1790 event has got above 500. Um, the lower grade rocks also have 1790 monazite, um, but they have fairly high temperatures, but 650. Uh, however, that's not enough to reset the ages of monazite. So I think it's very likely that the monazite has actually been recrystallized by fluids. Um, so I suggest that um, the lower grade rocks um, have actually had fluid infiltration and this is perhaps like obliterated an earlier higher pressure event. Uh, however, the garnets seem to have preserved the ages of the earlier event. So perhaps uh, the monazite reacted to the fluids but the garnet hasn't uh, and it's just kind of stuck around for a while. <laughs> um, so again, I would suggest perhaps this is like a, a large scale post orogenic fluid event. So this kind of happened at the end of the Speckofanian because we get all these 1790 ages. Okay, so now I'm going to switch over to 
Lutishi Mahafniam. Uh, so it actually seems that most of the garnets which are higher in uranium are low in lutetium and vice versa. So if you can do both methods, you have an advantage. Um, lutetium hafnium method has been applied to garnet related to mineralization, such as like pegmatite, greenstone. Um, but I think it's kind of more suitable for, for metamorphic garnets, although you really have to pick, again, uh, I think it depends on like the whole rock composition and then also how much garnet you have because garnet really likes lutetium. So if your rock has a lot of garnet, then your garnets don't have a lot of lutetium because they kind of have to share it. Um, uh, and the lutetium hafnium method can be applied to an increasing range of minerals. So not just garnet, but apatite, xenotime, calcite, dolomite and fluorite. Uh, which I will talk about a bit more at the end, but it's quite exciting, I think. Uh, so again, lutetium hafnium garnet dating method is very new. So the first paper for this came out in 2021 by uh, Alexander Simpson uh, from the University of Adelaide. Uh, and it's pretty like interesting how it's been developed. Uh, so the issue with lutetium hafnium dating is that uh, you want to measure lutetium and hafnium, and they have, they both have 176. Um, so we we can't measure with a conventional uh, ICPMS because you can't just measure 176 because you have both of them on there. So you have to kind of remove one to measure the other. Um, so previously, this was only done with the column chemistry. So you would separate out the elements and then you would measure the masses uh, separately. So you knew what you were measuring. Um, but now with this uh, triple quad or LAICPMSMS, it's possible to, to separate out uh, the elements. The, the idea here is that you have like one mass spectrometer and that lets through 176. So that's what you're interested in. And then everything goes into this collision cell and reacts with gases. And you want your lutetium and ytterbium, which both interfere with hafnium, to be like reacting and making a different product than hafnium. And then you measure the hafnium product only, which is at 258. Uh, so it's quite a big thing, uh, mass that you're measuring. Um, but it seems to work quite well. Uh, so far. Uh, it does require quite a big spot size. Um, but uh, yeah, I guess partly it's because garnet doesn't have so much uh, lutetium. Uh, and then it doesn't have that much hafnium either. Uh, so lutetium hafnium measurements produce an isochron age. Um, and I think when you, you have to think about where the lutetium is in the garnet. So typically, uh, as I said, garnet really likes lutetium. So when the garnet grows, it takes up as much as it can. So the lutetium hafnium age should give you like a core age. But this isn't the case in all garnets. Uh, so if you get a weird age, then maybe check where your lutetium is in, the, in your garnet. Um, Another thing I said is that it really, you need to have garnet that has lutetium in it for this to work. And this is because uh, the higher lutetium content you have, the more spread you have on your isochron, so the better defined your age is. Um, yeah, so I tried to show that with this orange part on the right, which more analysis here is more constrained age. Uh, so. I think I will show you some that are not super constrained and you just see that the error is much bigger. Um, and if it has really low lutetium, it doesn't work at all. <laughs> it's just very, very narrow window and you really don't get any age. Uh, so it is possible to get ages from zoned garnets. So there's actually now two papers about this. So Tamblum at uh, 2021 looked at garnets from the Western Nice region. Uh, so they found cores and rims that they could get ages from. Um, and recently, like just 
last month even. Uh, Simpson at our 2023 uh, have a paper on polymetamorphic garnet from Scotland, which is great because I worked on those in my PhD and it's good to see more ages there. Um, so yeah, I think, again, I think you have to check where the lutetium is hosted in your garnet. So if your garnet has all lutetium in the core, then you probably won't get any age from the rim because uh, just that won't have enough lutetium to give you the spread you need. Uh, but yeah, I think it's very promising. Uh, so we have new dating options. Um, so we have garnet now with uranium, lead, lutetium, hafnium, and aptite, um, which I will talk more about at the end. Uh, but uranium lead for aptite has fairly low closure temperature, like 500 degrees, um, but lutetium hafnium in aptite has a high closure temperature of like 700 degrees, which means that you can possibly get crystallization ages from uh, aptite with lutetium hafnium, which you can't with uranium lead because it just gets reset by whatever comes along. Uh, so yeah, some good options, I think. Uh, so next I'm going to talk about my in situ lutetium hafnium results, uh, which I got fairly recently in Adelaide. Uh, and these are kind of just examples of what kind of stuff you can date. Uh, so we looked at some uh, LCT pegmatites, which just happened to have Ghana in from Finland. Uh, and these gave us an age of 1800. So you can see Actually, this is a good one. It doesn't have as much spread, so it only goes to eight here, uh, which means we have a bigger error. So it's 1,800 plus or minus 55. Uh, so the only other age constraint from this area is a zircon pegmatite age, which is 1,790. So it kind of is pretty consistent with that. Uh, and apparently many of these uh, LCT pegmatites are garnet bearing. So this could be a really good way of getting um, ages from these because some of the zircons are not very happy. Uh, so it's good to have another option. Uh, so I also looked at garnet from um, the Sotkamu silver mine. So this is actually hosted in an Archean greenstone belt in Finland. So all the zircon ages from this uh, area are Archean. Um, but the age we got from Garnet, which is actually inside the deposit, was 1870. So something is going on here. Uh, probably there's some sort of Speckophanian overprint and fluid mobilization in the Archean rocks, uh, which wasn't recorded at all by Zircon, but it has been recorded by the Garnet. Uh, so that's actually a really interesting result. Uh, so finally, well, no, not finally, second to last, uh, I looked at garnet from a scandium deposit. So this is actually a garnet bearing ferrodiorite. Uh, so at the moment, I think scandium is a very interesting uh, element that people are after for various purposes. Uh, and this deposit was found by GTK uh, and it's actually the zircons in this scandium deposit, uh, they fluoresce, uh, which is apparently really weird. And they're also quite big. Um, and the zircon age from here is, I think, 1860, they were dated at. Uh, the garnet age was 1824, and actually it's quite well defined. So there's a bit of a difference there, which I'm not entirely sure the significance of at the moment. But um, it seems that garnet in the scandium deposit at least uh, has quite a lot of lutetium, so it's really good for dating. Uh, so that's quite interesting. Uh, so the final mineral mineralization related garnet I looked at was garnet occurring in a gold deposit. Uh, this is also hosted in Archean uh, in the east of Finland. Uh, so the garnets, um, we dated two garnet samples from here. So one was a pegmatite, which cross-cuts the sediments that host the gold. Um, and the other is the host rock itself. Uh, so you can see 
on this core image above, the garnets are kind of uh, forming a little chain on the right-hand side in this layered rock. Uh, and there's all these cross-cutting veins, which is where the gold is hosted. Um, okay, so from this region, the gold hosting sediments have zircon, um, and it has max depth ages of 1730. Uh, the pegmatite, which cross-cuts the se sediments, uh, had lots of really sad zircons, uh, and there was two that were concordant at uh, 2725 uh, million years. Uh, and from the same region, there's been some monazite uh, dating done, um, and they found two metamorphic ages. So one is 2.62 or 2.66, and the other was 1840. Okay, so the garnet ages that I got for the cross cutting pegmatite, I got uh, 2620 from the garnets. Um, although we did have this weird um, kind of spread, uh, which you can kind of see here. Uh, so they kind of spread to the right, and uh, but I took the youngest one, I think, and it gives uh, an isochron of 2160. So there's been something that's kind of pulling them uh, down. And if you look at the garnets from this place, uh, they all have these little iron-rich rims. So something has altered them on the rims, at least. Uh, but the core gives quite a good age of 2620. Uh, so as for the host rock for the gold, uh, all the garnets here were 1840. Uh, so it turned out that the garnet results fit really well um, with the metamorphic monazite ages of 2.6 and 1.84. Uh, as for the gold age, uh, the, host, the gold hosting rock itself gives an age of 1.84, and this pegmatite was strongly affected by fluids that are younger than 2.2. So I think perhaps this 1.84 age is maybe the, the most accurate for the gold forming or gold positioning event. Uh, so finally, my final example is a metamorphic garnet from a place called Okiluotu, which I always say wrong. And this is in Western Finland, so it's the other side. Uh, so here we had um, quite an interesting rock. Uh, it has kind of two sorts of garnets. So it has these ones that form in veins, which are massive. Uh, we have a nice example here of the left of one of these veins, which I've outlined in yellow dashes, and the really big garnet in the middle. Uh, and then also the matrix has lots of little garnets in it, um, which are maybe a few millimetres in diameter. Uh, so I took a sample of the big garnet, like this garnet exactly is what we dated. Um, and also a bunch of the little garnets for, for dating. So previous PT work is four kilobars and 650 to 700. The rock apparently crystallized at 1860 and it has had two metamorphic events, which based on the zircon is 1.83 and 1.81. Although which one is the age of the PT is, I'm not sure. Uh, so our core age was 1830. Uh, so the, the, the inner, our core garnet age is 1830. So the core, um, it looks different, but there was no difference in the age of the core and the rim. So they were identical in error. Um, and they also, I mean, they have, both have quite a good spread as well. So, yeah. That they're basically the same age. Uh, the matrix garnets, uh, they're texturally very different to the big, the big garnets, uh, and they're also much less radiogenic. We have a, a much narrower spread and a bigger error. So uh, it seems like an older age, but it's actually in error, so we can't say that they're older, just that they're different. Um, so... I don't know if you noticed, but uh, the big garnet has lots of apatite inside. So they're mostly occurring in the rim of the garnet. 
Uh, so we also dated the appetite for this one and the uranium lead and the lutetium hafnium age of the appetites are identical. Uh, so about 1790 again. Uh, so potentially the garnet, the matrix garnet is earlier. There's definitely two metamorphic events, but it looks like 1.83 and 1.79 instead. Uh, and the PT work is yet to be done, but should be soon. <laughs> uh, yeah. So I think that has worked pretty well. So I, I, I endorse lutetium hafnium dating. If you have the opportunity, you should do it. Um, and it works on other minerals. Uh, so I did mention appetite. So we got some really nice ages from the appetite. Um, and apparently it also works with calcite and calcite has very little common hafnium. So you can almost get single spot ages, although you have to use a huge spot uh, to do it. Uh, and now there's been a very recent paper uh, on fluorite dating uh, by lutetium hafnium. It's in Geoscience Frontiers uh, and it's just online. So check that if you're interested. And apparently they're also testing epidote. Uh, so if, I think if there's a mineral that you want to date, um, you can ask. Uh, I think some, I think they're willing to try things. So or you can try yourself if you have a triple quad. Uh, okay, that's all I have to say for now. So I'll say thanks. Uh, and that's my email if you want to contact me. I'm also on Twitter and I have a website which is a work in progress. Uh, so hopefully it will improve in the future. So that's all. Thanks. Thanks. Catherine, it's a very good presentation. It's a lot of things more than garnets. Yeah. <laughs> so we have some time to uh, answer some questions. If uh, anyone has some questions, send to us on the chat. Good, I think you have someone. Yes. Yeah, I'm going to start. Uh, when talking about uranium lead, you mentioned there are difficulties sometimes of getting a good quantity of uranium to actually date it, especially mm -hmm. if you're not working with the Grossular Androtide series of garnet. I was wondering if you have like any tips on like a minimum uranium that we should have or something like this to kind of narrow down and navigate if it would work and would be valuable of our time to actually date, try and date actually this garnet. Yeah, I think they're like, I think they're like PPB usually uranium. I'd have yeah. to check some papers to give you exact numbers, but um, the ones that you worked with were uh, more the Almondine series than the the Grossular one. Uh actually, yeah, the the ones we worked in Finland were Almondine garnets, uh, and there is a paper by Shinor as well looking at Arasui rocks, and yeah. they also have Almondine garnet, but it's like really low uranium so you really just have to try and see if it's gonna work yeah we've tried in free samples and only one worked so yeah that, i tried to as was... well uh a few of my brazilian rocks and nothing that was they had nothing so but maybe it will work for lutetium hafnium yeah it's the next steps that we're thinking yeah. of actually thanks Uh, thank you, Kate. This presentation was really good. I really like all this talk about it. and also the economic application, like to thinking our formations. But I have um, one question about the, I know Garrett usually ha has a lot of inclusions. And mm -hmm. uh, how do you deal with that? You know, it's some problem to date because you also said that in Lutece Hafen, you need to have a really large spot size and uh, how to how can you deal with that yeah it is a problem uh so i guess if if your garnet has lots and lots of tiny inclusions then it's probably not suitable to date uh but we also do monitor uh i think there's a few uh elements that are included in the method uh, like zirconium uh and yttrium so if you hit something that will interfere 
uh, you should notice. Uh, and in many of my spots, actually, there was zircon. Uh, but the thing with zircon is it has so much hafnium that it's always at the top point. Uh, so it, it's common hafnium kind of overwhelms the hafnium signal. And because hafnium is so stable, like the, the ratios, they vary a very tiny amount. Uh, so it's always like the end, the, the, the uh, intercept basically of your isochron. So you can see the ones with zircon because they move up. But uh, just just want to make a comment. And first of all, that was a great talk. Thanks uh, for coming. Uh, but one thing is that the zircon can actually help you if your zircon is coeval with your garnets because you're pumping hafnium or lutetium and hafnium to the system, but you have to make sure they are coeval, that they crystallize it all together. Otherwise, your zircon is literally blowing your garnets. And in terms of hafnium, it's too high. Yeah, it's best to avoid the zircon. <laughs> yes. Uh, but I, uh, similar question to Guto. You were saying that the spot size for lutetium hafnium is really big, which is, it is, uh, we generally run 120, 150 microns. But what's the general general spot size you ran for Renulite? Because it's also really small. Yeah, uh, it was content. really big. Yeah. Uh, so that's over 200 microns? No, no, actually it was 100 we usually did. Um, yeah, I think bigger is is better for these kinds of things because it has so little uranium and lutetium present so you need you need a big spot unfortunately but it's it's quite easy for testing you just put it in you use your big spot if you don't see any signal then that's it next sample so yeah. i mean that that's way that's really good compared to the old way of dating garnet where you spend several weeks and you're like, oh, it didn't work. Yeah. And uh, I have another question, if you don't mind. Uh, of course. When comparing uranium lead and the tissue hafnium, which one do you think is the best to tie the garnet age to the PT conditions? Uh, well, I think for tying garnet age to PT, it doesn't really matter because uh, they should both give you the growth age of your garnet. Um, I think lutetium hafnium, sometimes maybe you should be careful because it might favor the core. So I think some of our rims might be younger, but because all lutetium is in the core, uh, we get like a core favored age, if that makes any sense. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But well, I there's a paper by, sorry. Oh yeah, it, there's, I think there's more that needs to be done in this area, <laughs> more work. Yeah, there's a paper by Ismi and EPSL that really shows that Samara New Demon prefers the rim. Yeah, exactly, so people the, have the done core. this before and I think we're seeing exactly the same thing with this in-situ lutetium hafnium. Yeah, I would just be very careful in terms of fluid events because I, I think around the lighting I think any minerals can be a bit more reactive than lutetium in case of garnets, for instance. Yeah, but I think the issue with, like, say, monazite uranium lead versus garnet is that monazite is very prone to recrystallization in fluids, whereas garnet, if if like garnet mode is stable at that particular PT or whatever, it's not going to do anything. Like, yeah, it's not likely to react, but not like monazite anyway. Yeah. There's also a larger surface area as well, which prevents it to react with fluids properly. Yeah. The monazites are so tiny. Any fluid that comes through is just. Quickly. Yeah, exactly. All right. Thanks. Thanks, Catherine. Uh, there are two questions here on the chat. I put here okay. and I, I will read for you. Cielito told, thanks for the cold presentation, for the cool presentation. <laughs> One question re regarding the apatite dates at 17, 90 million years. Could they also be interpreted as a cooling ages? Uh, 
they could they could be cooling age, but because we have the monzite that's the same age, I I would say it's dating this fluid event. And I think it's like fairly elevated temperature. Uh, so even though it's maybe fluid dominated, it's still it's still got hot because we see we see this everywhere, and it is acknowledged as this last event. And there's also 1790 granites as well. So I think the crust was hot at that point. Uh, and I think the monazites were recrystallized by the fluids and the appetites. I'm not sure if they're fluid or cooling. Well, in this sense, the appetite could easily be reset by thermally activated volume diffusion yeah. if the temperature is so high. And then the monazite is just being recrystallized because it loves some fluids. Yeah. And that's a easy problem to solve. You just get some trace elements and figure it out. The yeah, appetite I should do that. Yes. <laughs> yeah. If, if they have, if they have seen some fluids, you see an in, a depletion of light red earth elements very clearly. And that's going to be straight. Like it's very clear. That's going to be fluid altered, let's say. Yes, thanks, thanks, Bruno. <laughs> and the, the, there is another question here about uh, Kimberly. Uh, how thick a section would you need? Um, these sections. Is this for garnet? I, I think um, for garnet, it's best to do it in a mount. So you like cut out your grain and then you put it in like a 2.5 centimeter epoxy mount. Uh, and the idea here mostly is that the you can fit a lot more mounts in the laser than you can thin sections. So, and the idea is you want to like run overnight and maybe run like 800 spots. Uh, so if you have the mounts, you can put 20 samples in at the same time. Whereas if you have the thin sections, you can do like four. But I think there's also a danger of the laser drilling through the thin section. So, yeah, mounts are better, I think. Yeah, in the mount. yeah. okay. <laughs> yeah, so I've, we... I've always done in, in thin sections and 30 microns work okay, but you have to adjust the laser fluency. So you yeah, can exactly. work 10 hertz, otherwise it's definitely drilling through. But if, it, if you work around five, six hertz, that should be fine. You have enough uh, pulses to have a good signal. Yeah, and it doesn't go through the thing section. Yeah, I think they've tested it as well. Yeah. Yeah. But the good thing of making a mount is that you can just drill as much as you want and get as much signal. Yeah. And, and then, then like afterwards, good. you can polish it and then do your yeah. mapping or whatever after. Like, exactly. Yeah. And the point of running lots of samples as well it makes things. Yeah. Really well, I mean, I think that's the, mo the main reason they told me to make the mounts for doing this yeah. just so they could fit them all in. We can do Yeah, in our holder, I can only put like six samples. Yes. Mm -hmm. Great. So if anyone have some questions, I, th I think we will finish. Ah, we have some comments about Lucas Eduardo. Amazing talk, Catherine. Good to see you again. And you are working for Finman. <laughs> Thanks, Lucas. <laughs> Thanks a lot, I Kat. Have, oh, I have a last okay. final question. Uh, okay. What do you think it's the next steps for Garnet geochronology? What do you think it's yet to be done? Yes, a good uh, I think just doing more is good. Uh, but then I, I also think maybe we should do more of this trace element mapping and perhaps get a better understanding of where lutetium and uranium are hosted in the garnet and exactly what we are dating. Yep. So, cool. yeah, that's my answer. Uh, we got to work for it. <laughs> yeah. All right. Thanks a lot for coming to the talk. I um, I'm really apologize for the beginning. My internet dropped, uh, but I'm, I'm very happy with your talk. It was really good. Oh, well, thanks for having me. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks a lot, Catherine, and uh, for everybody, follow us, follow us on the social media. <laughs>
And thanks, Guto. Thanks, Bruno. Thanks, Regiane, for stay here with us today. Thanks, everyone, for joining and watching us. Thank you, Catherine, for being around. If you have more cool stuff in the future, come back and talk to us. It's always nice to have <laughs> right. interesting things to discuss. So, right, cool. Thanks. Bye-bye. Bye. A great day, everyone. Bye.